Hi guys, this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was in Game of Thrones. Many know Robert's first and only legitimate child was stillborn. But what if that was wrong? What if the gods, namely the Shinigami, intervened at the last moment? What if the deity pulled a hero from his collection and placed it in the child? To become a hero of the Seven Kingdoms? Empowered to combat treachery? To bring peace to the world? His name? Naruto of House Baratheon. Welcome aboard. Chapter 7 Red Wedding Part 2. The twins sometime later. Rob Stark's army and entourage were parked outside of the twins for the wedding of his uncle Ednir and Walder Frey's daughter Rosaline. When Rob arrived at the massive castle and bridge rolled in one, it was clearly meant to be a grand event for both houses. He walked into the large castle-based bridge with a sense of unease with his wife and his mother beside him while his dire wolf Grey Wind was forced to go to a pen for safety reasons as Black Fry had stated. Though Rob could tell his trusty animal companion, who had followed us into battle, was not happy and sensed something was off almost right from the start. Rob wanted to keep Grey Wind close, but the dire wolf had to be put in a pen or it would be considered an insult to House Fry. And Rob wasn't about to give more than one apology for insulting Walder Fry within his own home. One apology to the old man was bad enough as it was and had to last for a lifetime with him. But having to give out two made him want to take the black instead and the thought was very tempting, if not for the fact he was married with a child on the way. My honored guests, be welcome within my walls and at my table. I extend to you my hospitality and protection in the light of the seven, said Walder Fry from his seat at the head of the long table reserved just for him and watched Rob Stark along with his wife Talisa Mager Stark approach him. We thank you for your hospitality, my lord. I have come to make my apologies and beg for your forgiveness, said Rob humbly before Walder Fry as he had long since been taught by his mother in the arts of diplomacy when dealing with those spurned by your own actions. As he bowed slightly before the old man, Rob missed the smirk on Walder Frey's face, and the one on Roose Bolton standing slightly behind Caitlin Stark. The two men had been getting things prepared ever since they got Ednir Tully roped into the marriage with Rosalind Fry. They had planned it long before today when Rob Stark first broke his marriage agreement to marry one of Walder's daughter and Roose Bolton had offered to throw in his support if House Fry backed House Bolton in being the new Warden of the North. Of course, to do that, the backing of the crown was needed, but they knew King Naruto would never support such a move if they approached him on the issue. Even if Roose Bolton decided to have the entire North Sea seated and became king, the other houses in the North would be more loyal to House Stark. Add to the fact this wedding would result in killing the Northern Lords, plus a few of their sons, would result in the entire North rising against him, unless he had support from key players. Namely House Fry and House Lannister. Roos had wanted to approach Tywin sometime during the war about partnering with this secret alliance. But Tywin dared not agree to anything with his son and heir captured under the banners of the North. Plus, the ceasefire came into effect before a message could be sent out. The ceasefire was another thing that infuriated Roos Bolton to no end. A ceasefire was a means for your hated enemy to recoup their losses, regain their strength, and come back to crush you instead of the other way around. The fact Rob Stark agreed made Roos believe the time of House Stark ruling the North was over, and the time for House Bolton to rise up was upon them. All he had to do was ensure all the men loyal to House Stark at this wedding met a violent painful end at the hands of his own men, who were all given the secret order, and when the time was right, stay in this wedding with the blood of the North. The only snag to the plan was Jamie Lannister being well guarded by Brienne of Tarth along with some sharp-eyed Northerner soldiers per Caitlin Stark's command. With the ceasefire in effect and a chance for peace, it was decided to keep the man placed under a stronger group to guard him. Unfortunately, none of Bannermen assigned to watch the Kingslayer were from House Bolton, which made it even more difficult for his men to free Jaime during the attack. If something went wrong, Tywin Lannister would soon become his enemy, and Roose Bolton knew long ago to not make the Lion your personal enemy, especially when the Lion could be an ally and a wealthy one to back you when needed. The problem was securing the alliance with Tywin and promising him Jaime Lannister being brought back to him alive, if not whole. Or rather, mostly whole. Tywin might have to endure having his son somewhat crippled in order to humble the man into not making any plans of revenge against House Bolton or possibly House Fry later on. That was the initial plan, but Roose Bolton soon realized that there was more than one Lannister he could bargain with and not violate the ceasefire. This Lannister's name? Cersei. 
Cersei the queen brother fucking Regent Lannister. She would do anything get Jaime back at this point and would ensure a fair amount of gold was given to provide his safe return to her arms. It would make Roose Bolton gag and vomit inside knowing the relationship between those two, but the gold he would gain, plus the backing needed to claim the North for his house would all be worth it in the end. Roose Bolton, the king in the North. It had a nice ring to it, thought Roos while he watched Walder Fry waddle his old wrinkly form in front of Rob Stark and his foreign wife. Love. That's what Starks in Winterfell call it, eh? Very honorable. I call it a pretty face. Hmm. Very pretty. Prettier than this lot, that's for sure. Very shapely as well. Oh, you try to hide it under that simple dress. If you wanted to hide her your grace, you shouldn't have brought her here in the first place, said Walder with a chuckle knowing his crude humor would have to be tolerated by Rob Stark toward his wife since the twins belong to him. And everything in it too. I now wish I had kept her away. Mother too. Something feels wrong here. Grey Winds sensed it and I trust my dire wolf over any fry here, thought Rob while Walder gave Talisa another once over. I can always see what is going on beneath the dress. Been at this a long time. I bet when you take that dress off, everything stays right where it is. Doesn't drop an inch. Your own king says he betrayed me for love. I say he betrayed me for firm tits and a tight fit. And despite the scorn I feel from the act, I can respect it all the same. When I was your age, I would have broken fifty oaths to get into that without a second thought, said Walder with a sickly old grin that made Rob angry, Talisa and Caitlin want to shudder in revulsion, but all three suppressed their emotional responses with great difficulty. Then you my lord, said Rob while holding in his temper and seeing Walder instruct his most important guests enter his hall while the rest of the army encamp outside. My lord! My lord! Another army is approaching, exclaimed Black Fry, as he ran into the room just as everyone was seated, and made everyone frown with concern. Oh! And who would march against my house with such a massive army of so many houses here to defend it? Tywin Lannister? Those squid fuckers from the Iron Islands, asked Walder while seeing his son's face was pale from seeing the sigil of this unknown army. It is the army of King Naruto. He is currently marching with an army comprised of both the Kingsguard and the bannermen of House Baratheon with him leading it. The Hound is also with him, said Black Fry while many gasped and others frowned at this news. Why would the king in the south wish to march an army here against me? I have done nothing wrong to deserve this advancement on my territory, said Walder while he gave Roos a brief glance. Yes father. I told him that. But the man insisted on coming here for the wedding and explained he was a bit upset he wasn't sent an invitation to this monumental event. The king said this spurn against him, the crown, and House Baratheon will be forgiven if he along with his army was allowed to join in on the festivities, said Black while Walder frowned further since this was not the plan, but it could still work if they played their hands right. With the King of Kings landing dead, those who benefited from his death would reward House Fry beyond all measure despite the initial public outcry from the lowborn. Not that Walder Fry cared about what lowly peasants thought of him since the only thing that mattered was who among those in high standing would reward him for doing such an action. Namely the king's own mother, who he heard had another son lined up to take the Iron Throne, one she wanted to sit on the Iron Throne, and would no doubt ensure House Fry was protected from those who would seek to punish his house for the soon-to-be betrayal. The Joffrey boy was clearly weak from what Walder had heard of him, both mentally and physically, but the mother was not. Walder knew she would use Joffrey to give the Lord of House Fry whatever he wanted and that was perfectly fine with Walder Fry since he intended to name a steep price be paid for what was about to happen later. And the old man wanted a lot. Who am I to turn away a king? Especially one that rules over so many kingdoms and people. Let him come and enjoy all that House Fry has to offer at this wedding under the protective light of the seven, said Walder Fry while giving Roose Bolton a knowing look, which the man gave a discreet nod and knew his men would have to be told of this change in plans. Sure enough, the doors to the main room were opened wide for all to see the entrance of King Naruto Baratheon in all his royal glory. He walked like a man who was in charge and had no fear of his surroundings when entering the room. Beside him, a few steps just short of being near the king, was the hound himself in all his terrifying burn-faced glory, and he had a grin on his face that made many in the room nervous. Around them were Kingsguard and House Baratheon bannermen all here to serve their king to the best of their ability. And unknown to House Bolton or House Fry, they were all well fed and well rested for tonight's event. 
The king had made it no secret to his men what was going to happen here at the twins and what needed to be done to prevent it. As such, all of his men were given plenty of food and drink prior to coming here so they wouldn't really need to eat or drink anything House Fry offered during the celebration. Naruto knew for this grand wedding to turn into a grand massacre, Walder Fry would have to poison or drug the food, if not the wine to make the bannermen loyal to Rob Stark unable to fight back when the trap was sprung. Weak and Stark soldiers would be child's play to kill if the bannermen of House Bolton and House Fry moved in fully refreshed without any fatigue on their part. But not Naruto. Not the king. And certainly not his men. Half were sworn to protect him as their king and the other half of his men wished to redeem themselves for choosing to fight for Stannis after Renly died. None of the men in Naruto's army were going to fuck this up and Naruto himself knew this. They were here to prevent a grave injustice from happening at the twins and by the seven they were going to do their part. The honor and pride as loyal servants of the crown if not the house they served was at stake. Walder of House Fry. Words cannot describe how good it is to finally see the Lord of the Twins face to face. You look exactly as I imagined you to be after I asked people about your appearance, said Naruto in a hearty tone while walking toward the old man and many noticed the man's back was sporting his sword strapped to his back. You honor me your grace. It's not every day I have a wedding with two kings as my guests. The king in the north and the king of King's Landing, said Walder Fry with a grin while Naruto had to bite back the urge to vomit when the smell coming off of the old man hit his nose. When was the last time this old man took a bath, thought Naruto, as he could tell the old bastard smells of piss. Shit, and other bodily fluids that should not be on an old man, much less his clothes. Let the celebration begin, declared Walder Fry while everyone decided to be happy, celebrating the wedding, drinking, eating, and dancing around. Before long, the moment where Edmure Tully married Roslyn Fry happened with both becoming officially one under the light of the seven. It made the men and women in the room cheer while seeing a joyous occasion unfold. After so much time spent had been fighting, killing, and burying the dead after all the battles waged, the sight of a couple getting married was a nice change of pace. Even Naruto, for all his planning and not get too deep in the celebrating, smiled at the sight of Edmure and Roslyn becoming a happy couple in the eyes of the seven. Sadly, he also knew for this moment to stop being a tragedy, the trap must be revealed, and be sprung not by House Bolton or House Fry, but by himself. Sitting next to him, Sandor Clegane drank from his cup of wine, making sure the wine given to him was the same poured into the cup of a Fry or Bolton Bannerman. Naruto had done the same since he knew Boltons and Freys would drink and eat for a time, but with separate food and drink that wouldn't disorient or poison themselves. His men with him had done the same, as they caught on to what the hound, and their king had done in terms of what they did to eat or drink some items without giving themselves away. So, when do you suppose the real entertainment begins for all of these Bolton and Fry fuckers, mumbled Sandor from his cup while drinking to keep it muffled. Soon. Edmure and Rosalind need to seal the deal in the bedroom in order for the marriage to be legitimate in the eyes of gods and men. With this union, the Freys have strong ties to the Riverlands, and Edmure being the liege lord can make them a powerful force to claim it. If Roslyn has a child, it will be the heir to Riverrun, and House Fry could easily remove Edmure while manipulating his child to be like a Fry, said Naruto in a quiet tone. Which means all the Riverlands are fucked if that happens, remarked the Hound in a guttural tone. Agreed. The Blackfish is leaving the room. Go inform him of everything that is about to happen, but do it discreetly. We need to get word to the other men of House Stark of the betrayal about to take place here, said Naruto with the Hound nodding. And if any Fry or Bolton men get in my way, asked the hound with Naruto smirking at him. Easy. Be your usually charming, face-smashing, violent self, and play it off to being a mean intoxicated drunk, answered Naruto with Sandor Clegane laughing. I knew I was right when I made the decision to fight for you, remarked Sandor Clegane before he got up and walked out of the room with the blackfish still walking in front of him. Damn right you did. Who else is going to make use of your skills in the right manner? whispered Naruto to himself while he glanced over at Walder Fry, who was looking up slightly at the musicians now going into a rotation, and saw some of them were discreetly putting down arrows near some reachable crossbows. The massacre was going to happen soon. He needed to stall for time until Sandor could speak to the Blackfish and rally the men. Your grace, while I have heard many stories about the free cities of Essos, they have always been second-hand accounts. As someone who has spent most of their life there, would you perhaps delight us with a story or two of your experiences during that time?" asked Walder Fry while hoping the man would talk about his time in Essos so his men could get into position. 
Right before the trap was sprung and killed the king along with Rob Stark, his mother, wife, and all his bannermen loyal to them. Walder Fry, the killer of kings. It had a nice cruel sadistic ring to it. Such an act would make what Tywin Lannister's past actions with a certain rival house filled with lion's pale by its very comparison. I know a few stories. Some more violent than others. Most of what I could tell you is not something one hears when at a wedding, replied Naruto while standing now and walking toward Walder Fry with a deliberate slowness. Nonsense. Any story told is a good story. As the lord and ruler of the twins, I insist upon it, said Walder while Naruto pretended to think about it while secretly glancing at the musicians above him playing music while waiting for the signal to begin their part in this trap. Well, I do know one story, remarked Naruto offhandedly. We are all ears your grace, replied Walder with a smile. Well, if you insist. This story takes part during my years in the fighting pits. I was about 15 years old at the time. I had been in the fighting pits of Marine by this point. Before that, I had traveled Yunkai, Astapor, and even Volantis where I met so many influential people. All of which had traveled to Marine as spectators to witness me in the fighting pits and see my skills firsthand against a small army of warrior from all over the world. Knights of Westeros. Water dancers from Bravos. Even some Dothraki horse warriors, who had lost their call at some point, were among those I fought and killed in the arena. Whenever I fought, people cheered me, chanting my name or the name they gave me at any given time. I reveled in their praises as a great prodigy and warrior of the arena the likes they had never seen, said Naruto while he walked closer to Walder with a smile on his face. I bet your owner got many a coin for your actions and a bunch of those pleasure slaves as well. Maybe he even tossed you one on the side to make you into a real man, added Walder Fry with a laugh. Not right away. I wait until I was in my later teens when my body was more developed and was perfected upon maturity. But not everyone was happy with me winning all the time. You see my owner had somehow earned the scorn of a wise master in Marine during our time there. I don't know if it was some kind of deal gone wrong or a gambling debt being called in by the wise master, but the man in question wanted my owner to have me lose on purpose in my next match. To even go so far as to have me die at the hands of my opponent to square away the debt, said Naruto while Walder laughed. I bet you didn't like that very much, remarked Walder before taking a drink of his wine. No, I didn't. Especially when he told me that I might not have a choice since this wise master of Marine was incredibly influential. If we didn't do what he wanted, both of us would be dead before the sun set by the end of the day, said Naruto while Walder was a bit intrigued at how the wise master could be so devious. So, what did you do your grace? Given how you are standing here, I imagine you didn't roll over for this so-called wise master, questioned Walder while everyone listened to the story. No. I didn't. I had my own pride as a warrior and fighter. Any man who lays down for some rich weak shit, who thinks the world owes him everything just because he has more gold or silver in his pocket, doesn't deserve to call himself a fighter. The wise master however, wanted my owner to lose no matter what, and arranged for me to face a giant of a man named Toroth. In fact, I would go so far as to say Toroth was essentially Essos's version of the mountain Gregor Clegane. Big, brutal, loved to fight, and to fuck women whether they were willing or not. Needless to say, some people thought I was dead the moment my match was announced, said Naruto while stopping his walk until he was at the table that stood between him and Walder Fry. How fortunate for us those who didn't believe in you were proven wrong, remarked Walder, though Naruto since the man was slightly upset Toroth didn't kill him. Yes. Well, he certainly tried to kill me. The man had killed quite a few of the other combatants before he got to me just to prove his terrifying prowess in battle. When we finally went at it however, I found myself not being terrified of him as one would think, and easily made short work of him. Do you want to know how, replied Naruto with a tone in his voice Walder couldn't decipher. By all means, share with us your wisdom on how one is to defeat such a foe similar to the mountain, perhaps the men from House Stark could learn a thing or two from such advice, replied Walder Fry while Naruto smirked and ignored the insult to House Stark that the old man had hit them with. You go for the man's legs. Everyone is so intimidated by the upper body, they forget to focus on targeting the lower body. I merely used my speed, maneuverability, skill, and just a small hint of luck added to the mix. I crippled his body to the point where he was just a waste of space and flesh of a man, who could only do one thing, breathing. 
At least until I killed him in a most violent fashion and ripped his skull from his body before I crushed it in my hands in front of the entire crowd. In the end, my overall decision not to lay down upset the wise master most dearly, said Naruto while his hands twitched ever so slightly in wanting to give in to the impulse he felt when near this man. I can only imagine this wise master lost quite a bit of coin from your decision not to die for his enjoyment, remarked Walder since he knew if someone did that to him, the one responsible would suffer dearly along with the rest of the scorner's family. Oh yes, he did lose quite a sum. When the time came for the expected retaliation, it was surprising for us when it did not happen. At least, not right away, or in the way we were expecting, said Naruto casually while he shifted slightly and walked down to one end of the table before stopping almost in a dramatic sense. Oh? In what way your grace, asked Walder while he secretly motioned for his men to not do anything just yet. Well, for one, we were not attacked soon after the arena closed for the day as expected from such a scorn against a wise master. Instead, we were invited to a party. His party strangely enough. The wise master had planned his celebration in winning big in the fighting pits on his name day. Apparently, he wanted to have a party for two different reasons, and the invite was originally for my owner as a way of saying no hard feelings toward losing your fighter to mine when in truth it was just the wise master's cruel way of saying fuck you, to him. Sorry for my cursing Lord Fry but there was no other way to describe what the wise master wanted to do, said Naruto while Walder waved it off since he had done worse. It is all right your grace. I've said worse during many parties and celebrations. Though I am surprised and intrigued on why this wise master would invite you and your owner to a party after he lost so much by your hands, asked Walder Fry curiously while Naruto smirked and slowly turned around to slowly walk alongside the table until he stopped at the middle of the long table to look at the ruler of the twins. Why to kill us of course. To kill us in front of his friends, family, his slaves, and anyone else in the room wishing to see us die. The wise master wanted to make an example of us for what we did in defying him that day. You see, all of the wise masters of Mirin, of Yunkai, of Astapor, and the other free cities can't stand one thing above all else when it comes to their world of likes and dislikes. They can't stand the thought of someone like me, a mere brute used in the fighting pits for their entertainment, or my owner for that matter standing up against those in high society. They firmly believe that people like themselves with all their money, their fancy clothes, and collection of slaves who obey their every whim, are always right. They believe anyone who is not them are always in the wrong and should anyone try to stand up to them, even slightly, should be put to the sword. Regardless of age, gender, or profession in the life. In their eyes, everyone who is not a wise master or exceedingly rich is beneath them, said Naruto while turning more to face Walder Fry. And how did you and your owner escape the horrible trap that awaited the both of you, asked Walder curiously while leaning forward to indicate he was listening intently. We didn't escape the trap. Oh, we were cautious when attending. It was to be expected given we had just scorned a wise master and took a deep chunk of coin from his pockets. But after what seemed like hours at the party, nothing happened. It was only when we let our guard down did the wise master give the signal and the trap was sprung with just about everyone in the room pointing some kind of stabbing weapon at us, said Naruto while Walder leaned even further and was enraptured by his words. How did you escape the trap? asked Walder with Naruto smirking. Simple. We fought our way through the trap as it was sprung up on us. Which wasn't easy since we had to surrender our weapons at the door, but when you are trained to fight like us, things like swords, knives, spears, and other stabbing weapons are mere tools in our deadly hands. Mere extensions you only use for their extra reach when wanting to kill someone up close. When it all over, the wise master was dead, and all those at his party were dead with him. Sadly, my owner was badly injured during the fighting, and he died sometime later from the severity of his wounds, said Naruto while he mourned the loss of his friend who had played the part of being his owner since it was the only real way for him to go into the fighting pits at such a young age. At least the old man went down fighting and dying from his injuries over dying in his bed of old age with piss staining the sheets. They had some good times together and the old man had given him everything in terms of money they saved up so Naruto could use it to travel around by himself. I applaud your skills your grace. There are few in this world who can say they escaped such a trap where death was a certainty, said Walder Fry while raising his glass to the young king and drank the wine in his cup. Indeed Lord Fry, but you need to understand one thing about me when it comes to a good party, and when I expect something bad to happen, said Naruto with a grin now and it was making Walder Fry a tad nervous. And what is that your grace, asked Walder Fry while Naruto's smile turned almost evil and his mismatched eyes seemed to glow. 
Before Naruto grabbed the back of Walder's head with his right hand and stabbed the man in the throat with the wrist blade from his left. Squelch. I always have a trick up my sleeve. Or rather, a blade, exclaimed Naruto while looking the shocked Walder Fry right in the eyes when he did it. And in that moment, all hell broke loose. With the hound and blackfish sometime earlier. The blackfish was glaring at Sandor Clegane. The two had gone out of their way to be somewhere private on the pretense of going to take a piss. Blackfish of course had to take one and he did with the hound not that far behind him after the latter had smashed the heads of a few frays and two bannermen of House Bolton before joining in the relieving of his bladder. After they had finished along with putting their mail bits away, the hound proceeded to inform the blackfish of what was about to happen, and they had to act now before it was too late. Of course, the blackfish being a tully, and the hound being the hound, the former was not about to trust the latter right away. You better be straight with me hound. I don't care how big or tough you are in a fight. You fuck with me, you better be ready to lose something in return for it, said Blackfish with the hound grinning with respect in his eyes for the Tully. Say what you will about House Tully, but the men born from said house were a tough breed in their own right. And judging from Caitlin Tully Stark's own reputation, their women were no doubt just as tough, if not more should you challenge them. You fucking Tullus. Is there anything you're not afraid of? Don't answer that. Look, I know you dislike me. Hate me even. No doubt because my house is known for making monsters like my brother. Especially my brother. Well, I will tell you this right now, I hate my brother, and I hate my house just as much as you love yours. My king came here with an army to help your great nephew keep his army from being annihilated here tonight. Believe me. Don't believe me. Draw your sword if you want. I don't fucking care. What I care about is doing what my king commands and right now he is commanding me to get you to move your ass to saving the lives of Stark Bannermen. Or do you want both House Bolton and House Fry fucking your house and House Stark in the ass before you can stop them from doing it? You know what men like Walder Fry and Roos Bolton are like when they go to that dark place in their hearts? What they will do to your sister. To your nephew's wife. You want that? Remarked Sandor Clegane while Blackfish just growled low and looked around for anyone spying on them. I'd sooner slit my own throat, said Blackfish while the hound just kept on grinning. I, I know you would. My king wants to keep the bond between House Stark and House Baratheon alive. Both him and your nephew bound together in honor and spirit just like his father and Ned Stark did all those years ago. He can't do that if your nephew is killed by these fucking Freys and Boltons seeking to end his life and all those of his bloodline if they get the chance, said Sandor Clegane, the Blackfish growling again. Does your king have a plan? asked Blackfish with Sandor's grin increasing. Aye, he does. First, it involves telling you what is about to happen. Second, is getting your great nephew's dire wolf out of his cage so it can go around ripping some fucking fry and Bolton throats out. Third, we get all your great nephew's loyal bannermen to stop drinking and eating before they become too incapacitated to fight back, answered Sandor while Blackfish nodded. You'll have to understand if I don't mourn your death should the dire wolf rip your own throat out, commented Blackfish while drawing his sword and Sandor doing the same. Fair enough. Just don't get in my way of killing these cunts when they are standing in my way. Rally your men and those of House Stark. I'll do my part to make your job a little easier on my end, said Sandor before walking off to give the signal to all of the Baratheon bannermen to begin the attack. The twins' main dining hall at the moment. Screams in the main hall were heard right after Naruto pulled his wrist blade out from Walder Frey's neck and watching the old man stumble for a second before falling over dead. A look of horror on his face befitting someone who didn't want to die and could only look up helplessly at the well-armored feet of the man who had ended his life. The dying man tried to say one final thing, but all that came out of Walder Frey's mouth was gurgling, and a fountain of blood currently causing him to choke for air that would not come. Ladies and gentlemen, the time for a happy wedding celebration here at the Twins is now officially over. Now it's time for a massive funeral filled with lots and lots of dead people. Let the bloodbath begin, declared Naruto while he glared at the now terrified Roose Bolton, who stumbled to stand while trying to draw his sword and in the process reveal he was wearing chainmail armor under his clothing, as if he was expecting a fight. Traitors, exclaimed Caitlin, as she put things together after seeing Roos's chainmail armor before seeing House Fry and House Bolton men were wearing their own. Roos Bolton by that point had tried to move to kill the Tully-born woman, only for a dagger thrown by Naruto to pierce his throat and the Lord of House Bolton stumbled back before he fell over dead. 
At the same time, Baratheon bannermen along with the Kingsguard in the room sprang into action and cut down the assigned men they were told to kill. It was not hard to determine who was who despite the chaos of it all, as Bolton bannermen had the symbol of their lord's house on their clothes, and the phrase in the room were mostly the house's bannermen disguised as servants meant to carry out the plan Walder Fry had given him. As for Rob Stark, he moved swiftly to his wife, tackling her to the ground when Lothar Fry had tried to kill Tylisa with a dagger. Grabbing one of his own, hidden in his boot, Rob stabbed Lothar in the leg multiple times, and making the man stumble back in pain just far enough for Grey Wind to charge through the doors to tackle the injured Fry to the ground. The dire wolf attacked in a frenzy, biting the man's arms, tearing out the flesh from the bone before finally ripping the man's throat out. Not that far away from them, Caitlin Tully Stark was currently trying desperately to fight off a Bolton bannerman with a carving knife, but the man was too strong, and had a crazed look in his eyes. One the red-haired Tully woman knew all too well, as it was the look of someone, who enjoyed the hurting of others no matter who that person was they were hurting. As the Bolton bannerman on top of Caitlin was moving the knife she was using against her own throat, a massive hand grabbed the man by the back of his head threw him into the wall with enough force to break his neck. When the Tully woman looked up at her savior, she was surprised to see it was none other than the Han Sandor Clegane himself, and he just nodded briefly before taking his sword to a terrified Fry bannerman, who was violently cleaved in two. Above them, the archers had tried to reach for their crossbows to fire down on their now late lord's attackers, which was ironic considering, but the hound had noticed the same thing Naruto did when glancing up at them, and the large Clegane had ordered Baratheon bannermen to storm the top floor during the attack. Each one of the fry archers were all killed before they even had a chance to load an arrow and fire at anyone. As for Naruto, he threw three daggers, killing three freys, drew his sword, and quickly went after five different Bolton bannermen. Two he killed before they could go after the lord of House Karstark and House Umber while the other three had tried to run upon his approach, but were quickly killed by the much faster in Movement King. All around him, it was a slaughter, as Baratheon bannermen and Kingsguard were killing Boltons, and the phrase while using the momentum of the surprise attack they took from their enemies. The very enemies, who had planned to use it on House Stark mere moments ago, but had been foiled by the unexpected arrival of the King of the Seven Kingdoms. And to make this even worse for the Freys, if not the Boltons, but the bannermen loyal to House Stark and House Tully were also getting in on the fighting the traitors. All thanks to the well-timed arrival of the Blackfish, who had discreetly warned his men and had them spread the word when he got outside. Those who were not too weak from drinking their wine or poisoned by said wine they drank had been rallied to protect their fellow comrades from the traitors seeking to end their lives. Under normal circumstances, they would have all fallen due to their enemies being stronger in terms of the numbers alone, not to mention the food, and some of the wine was poisoned. But thanks to the timely arrival of some much-needed reinforcement of House Baratheon and the Kingsguard had easily tipped things, barely in House Stark's and House Tully's favor. You're my favorite king that I have served thus far your grace, exclaimed the Han loudly to Naruto before he punched a Bolton bannerman in the face with enough force to cave his head in. If I didn't know you any better, I'd swear you were flirting with me Clegane. I didn't think you were like that, remarked Naruto before he did a spin kick and snapped a fry bannerman's neck. Shut it, countered Sandor while taking the heads off of two Bolton men trying to spear him and Naruto laughed. The twins some time later. When it was all said and done, House Bolton, House Fry, and their bannermen were all slain all around the twins. Blood and bodies were everywhere from one end of the two castle structures to the next and around it. The sigil flags of House Bolton and House Fry were on the ground, ripped apart, stomped on, dirted in the mud, and symbolizing the end of those two houses. Fitting considering how they planned to do the same to House Stark and House Tully. When it was over, the main hall had been cleaned up so the Lords of Riverlands, of the North along with Rob Stark, his wife, his mother, his mother's family, and his dire wolf were all on one side of a lawn, as well as cleaned, table. On the other side was Naruto, Sandor Clegane, the Kingsguard, and the bannermen of House Baratheon standing proud. I imagine you have questions. Questions that need answering, said Naruto calmly while Rob stared at the man with a deadly serious look on his face. It would be nice for once to get a straight answer from those who I sit across with at a table instead of fighting or killing, said Rob while glaring at Naruto while the man just laughed. Same here. But we can joke later. First, you are probably wondering why everything has happened the way they did, correct? Asked Naruto with Rob nodding. Why did House Fry violate guest rights? Why did House Bolton help them in this plot to kill us all, asked Rob with Naruto sighing. Well for one, you marrying your lovely wife sitting beside you was the main reason for Walder Frey's actions. 
He felt slighted by your decision to break your promise to marry his daughter and thus felt it was time to do something about the disrespect. As for House Bolton, Roose Bolton saw you as the next Ned Stark, and too honorable to do the job of fighting, much less ruling the North like he felt it was meant to be ruled. With a cold iron fist squeezing the life out of everyone to prevent them from becoming stronger than his house and opposing him. This wedding would have killed all the lords of the northern houses who would have fought back, plus those loyal to House Tully, and with Edmure here marring Walder Frey's daughter, he essentially would have gained control over the Riverlands using Roslyn. Unfortunately, there was another player in this plot to crush you, and she chose to keep her involvement a secret, said Naruto with shame in his voice. Who exactly? asked Talisa while she held a hand over her belly. My mother. Cersei Lannister, replied Naruto angrily. So, her father did violate the ceasefire, said Caitlin angrily while Naruto shook his head no. No, Tywin Lannister had nothing to do with this. He wouldn't risk Jamie's health during such a time when acquiring him through peace talks would be easier at this point. No. My not-so-innocent mother felt she could risk a secret partnership with House Bolton and House Fry in crushing the North in order to secure her brother Jamie through them. With both the North and the twins allied with her, my mother felt she could move against me next and use her newfound allies to take the throne back for Joffrey, said Naruto while sighing at the fact his own mother would conspire to kill so many people just to plot and plan in putting Joffrey back on the Iron Throne. Not to be crude your grace, but your mother is a fucking cunt for a queen regent, said the blackfish while Caitlin glared at her father's brother. Uncle, exclaimed Caitlin at his rude behavior before hearing Naruto laugh at hearing the perfect description of the Lannister woman. I agree with you blackfish. I hate my birth mother with all my being. The fact she is my mother is the only reason I don't have her killed now for what that woman tried to pull with me. The handmaiden Kushina, who was assigned to my care when in Essos, was more of a mother to me before her death. I would gladly give up the Iron Throne, the right to rule, the overall nobility that comes from my house if it meant I could have my surrogate mother live once more, said Naruto with memories of the woman being fair yet firm with him during his short childhood. Damn did he miss her. So, what happens now, asked Rob while Naruto sighed. Well for one, we need to figure out what to do with the twins, the remaining members of House Fry, and the remainder of House Bolton in the north. Varys has told me Roose Bolton's bastard Ramsay has some disturbing tendencies and has caused harm to many of the small folk around the Dreadfort. I suggest you take care of that on your end. Since Ramsay is a bastard, any claim to House Bolton is denied short of royal decree, and I will not legitimize such a sadistic man into such a house. I would sooner put him and all his friends, who help him, to the sword. Again, I'll leave him to you to handle. That's the North's business. There is also the issue of dealing with my mother, which I will handle on my end since that is my business. Since Tywin Lannister didn't know about this plot, the ceasefire itself is still in effect so hunting Lannister soldiers is out of the question, said Naruto with some of the lords not liking that last part. Jaime Lannister is still locked up. There were some Bolton men who tried to convince several of mine to leave, but Brienne of Tarth has a way of intimidating people, said Rob with Naruto letting out a chuckle. I know. I heard the stories. There is nothing wrong with a strong woman who can pick up the sword and fight. House Mormont has quite a few of them so never let it be said a woman can't fight like any other man. A weapon does not recognize either gender as the superior one. Nor does the stranger for that matter. Death claims all things equally in the end, said Naruto with Rob nodding since he knew House Mormont provided both male and female warriors when called upon to fight. I trust you won't be taking the Kingslayer while here, asked Rob with Naruto shaking his head no. No. If I take him now, Tywin Lannister goes on the offensive against you. I don't want to give him or anyone else the impression I will return Jaime simply because the man is my uncle and Tywin Lannister is my grandfather. When the peace talks occur, all guilty parties and all those who are fighting in this war will be gathered at King's Landing for this. Make no mistake Rob Stark, I will have peace throughout the Seven Kingdoms when this is done. This war will end soon. One way or another. I helped you keep the North from being sacked by the Greyjoys because I see an honorable man who will rule over his lands and the people justly as its warden. Your family has watched over the North long before today and I see no reason why that cannot continue to happen now following recent events, answered Naruto while Rob nodded since it was true on all fronts. What do you want to do with the twins? asked Rob while Naruto sighed again and looked around. If I had time? I'd have this place destroyed stone by stone. 
but that would take too much time, effort, and resources to do. None of which we have right now. Plus, the twins itself is not a bad place when you think about it. Just the sadistic house that has ruled over the region. Besides, I assume Ed Nir and Roslyn are now bound fully by marriage in the eyes of gods and men, said Naruto with Rob nodding. They did that in room away from what was going to be all the fighting. Less noise they heard outside their chambers, the easier it would be to focus on other things, said Rob while Naruto nodding. As such, I decree the twins to be under the control of House Tully. But seeing as how Ednir Tully here will be busy running things in the Riverlands as its liege lord, I think we can all agree the best person here to run the twins would be the Blackfish, replied Naruto with everyone looking at the Blackfish now. River Run and the Riverlands will always be my home. But someone needs to keep this damn structure running I suppose. Unless Ednir wants to trade castles, offered the Blackfish and got a few chuckles from everyone. I'll let House Tully sort out who rules where and what castle. The point is, the twins are yours to use how you see fit. Just don't go acting like House Fry and being a bunch of two-faced, arrogant, backstabbing shits. No one wants that, said Naruto with members of House Tully nodding. What about Sansa? When can she return to the north, asked Caitlin while Naruto thinking things over. I'm not sure. I would prefer to wait until the peace talks are happening in King's Landing so you can see her for yourself. After everything happens, she can return with you to the north. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to locate Arya Stark despite the best efforts of my Master of Whispers. He said there was someone matching Arya's description heading north, but that was a while ago, and I don't know if it was actually her or not. There is a chance it was Arya, but I can't say for certain, said Naruto with Caitlyn having mixed feelings about that. Arya is a Stark. A survivor. She will get back home when time permits. I'm confident in that regard, said Rob while Naruto nodded. Speaking of Starks, I would like to talk to Rob Stark along with the rest of his family consisting of his mother, his wife, his uncle, and great-uncle in private. If everyone else could leave for a moment, said Naruto while seeing the Northern Lords, the Hound, the Kingsguard, and Baratheon Bannermen leave the room. What do you wish to discuss your grace, asked Rob while curious about what the man in front of him wanted to talk about. I wish to talk about the future. Our future. As you know, my father and yours both had a strong bond that was considered by many to be unbreakable. That crap about your father being a traitor to mine and the crown is complete crap. I decreed as such. So don't worry about it. I want the both of us to have that same bond Rob. A new bond. One that once again unites House Stark and House Baratheon together, said Naruto while Rob was surprised and somewhat happy about it. But if Rob were to do that, he would have to forego the title of king in the north, said Ednir with Naruto nodding. True. But while Rob would not be a king, he would still be the warden of the north. A position that his father held and his father's father held for many years, replied Naruto with Rob looking relieved to hear that. I didn't ask to be king of the north. It was suggested and gained momentum by the other houses due to being infuriated by how the crown had treated my father. They considered it an insult to the North as a whole and to them, said Rob while Naruto nodded. I understand. There is also a more sensitive issue at hand pertaining to our houses that I wish to discuss with you away from the other lords, said Naruto with Rob frowning. What sensitive issue, asked Rob while Naruto sighed. The issue of your half-brother and mine. I'm speaking of Jon Snow and Gendry Waters, said Naruto with Caitlin Stark frowning at the mention of her husband's bastard. What about Jon? He's taken the black, said Rob like it was no secret. I know. But Ned Stark was a good honest man. I see that same honest man in you. Your entire family. From what my master of whispers has told me, John is very much a Stark in all but name. Correct, asked Naruto with Rob nodding. He is a Stark and I'm proud to call him my brother despite the sad fact he is a bastard. I know father wanted him legitimized for many years, but the idea of making him a Stark ran into some complications, said Rob with Naruto nodding and glanced at Caitlin Stark since he assumed she was the complication. I imagine it did. Like you, I also have a half-brother in the form of Gendry Waters. He is the last remaining bastard my father had since my other bastard for a half-brother Joffrey is not my father's child, and ordered all my other half-siblings killed at the secret behest of my mother to prevent anyone from taking the Iron Throne from him. 
As such, House Baratheon is hanging on by a trickle, and it needs to be protected from being wiped out, said Naruto while seeing Rob's frown increase from the confusion. What does this have to do with John exactly? asked Rob curiously. I want to add another Stark to your house. I want to legitimize John as a Stark. I know he has taken the black and as such has forsaken all titles or possible inheritance in taking it, but I think it's only fair the man continues to serve the wall as a Stark. Not as a Snow, said Naruto while Rob was shocked, as were the rest of his family with him. For what purpose, asked Caitlin while frowning at the idea of John becoming a Stark despite it being something her late husband had wanted for years. Something she had fought him for years over. To honor Ned Stark of course. The man died an unnecessary death. I wish to honor him and those of his bloodline. All of his bloodline. John falls into that category, said Naruto while Caitlin was frowning heavily at him. He is a bastard. I will never see him as anything else, Caitlin shot back. Mother, exclaimed Rob, but his mother stood up, looking furious as ever. No. I will not stand for such an act. John is a snow. He will live, breathe, and die as a snow. I will never acknowledge him as a Stark or the son of my husband. Do you hear me, your grace? Never, exclaimed Caitlin Tully Stark before she left the room in anger. Your house has a lot of anger in them, Blackfish, commented Naruto Blackfish nodding and letting out a chuckle. Don't hold it against her, your grace. Caitlin was raised in a firm belief and tradition that bastards in general were no good. She was taught to hate and loathe them no matter what deed they did. Good or bad? I never held it against Ned Stark for having a bastard. It happens a lot during times of war when men drown themselves in blood, wine, and the many women they meet, said Blackfish with Naruto nodding. Regardless, I intend to legitimize John as a Stark. At the same time, I intend to legitimize my brother Gendry. I am hoping to create future bonds between our houses in the years to come Rob. Not just between the two of us, but with John and Gendry added to the mix. This is the only true way I can think of that will make it work despite what your mother says about John, said Naruto with Rob nodding. I grew up with John. At first, I will admit this now, I wasn't fond of John because he was a snow, and it meant my father had been unfaithful to my mother. But, father confessed something to me. Something he made me swear never to tell anyone. Not even mother or any of my siblings. Something so intense that revealing it would bring down wave after wave of enemies House Stark would not have the strength to oppose. Even with House Tully on our side, said Rob with Naruto frowning. What truth, asked Naruto with Rob looking at the other members of his family. What I say here cannot be repeated to anyone. Understand, asked Rob while he saw them all nod. Tell us Rob. Whatever the secret is, it can't hurt us here, said Talisa with a hand on his own. John isn't a snow. He's not a bastard. It was a lie. A lie to protect him from his enemies all throughout the Seven Kingdoms. He is actually my cousin on my aunt's side of the Stark family, said Rob while the others were shocked by this. When did your father tell you this? asked Blackfish while Rob sighed. When I was 15 years old. He and mother had an argument over John being legitimized as a Stark. I could hear them from my room. After she had stormed out of their chambers, I went to talk to father. His back was to me when I entered. At the time, he was looking out of the window with the sad look on his face, and whispering how he was failing my Aunt Lyanna. I didn't understand him at first and when I asked why he was upset father turned to face me. I saw there was this look of, fear. Fear and guilt in his eyes. I don't know whether it was a moment of weakness or desire to just tell the truth for once, but my father told me everything. How Aunt Lyanna had loved Riagar Targaryen. Not Robert. How she had married the prince in secret when living in Dorne. How John was his child. How she now feared Robert's wrath if he learned the truth about her and Riagar being together. Learning about the child that was just born. She had father promise her that he would protect John with all his strength, power, and love for his family. She made him promise on his honor as a man, her brother, and as a Stark to protect her son from all his enemies until John was strong enough to do it himself. At the time, I didn't fully understand half of the reason why this was done, but father told me that I must keep it a secret from everyone. From mother. From Sir Roderick. From Theon. Maester Lewin. 
even from my siblings. So, I too made a promise to keep the secret. To protect John like father had been doing for years now. I treated John like family because bastard or not, he was a member of our family and was a Stark despite the lie denying him the right to call himself one, said Rob while feeling bad about keeping all of this from his mother, but his father had explained why, and it unfortunately made sense. Caitlin Tully Stark had despised John since his arrival at Winterfell. Believing the boy to be a creation of her husband and some unseen woman, a whore from Dorne no less. A woman who was no doubt a bastard herself. She had wanted John gone from Winterfell, from her life, from the North itself, and would have gotten her way too. If not for the fact Ned Stark ruled over the North and thus had the final say in how things were done, John would be anywhere but the North. But Ned Stark would not hear or speak of it. Ned had told his wife as such and refused to truly explain himself when she demanded to know why he was going against the social norm. Each time resulted in the two of them arguing before the Tully woman left in an angry huff each time. Sadly, if she knew the truth about John, her perception of him would no doubt change, and the once angry wife of Lord Stark would no longer hate him. The sudden change in mood around the poor boy would be easily seen or noticed by those in the north and eventually those further south like the scheming mines nestled in King's Landing. And not just King's Landing either, but all of the Seven Kingdoms. News of House Targaryen having an actual prince, who once upon coming of age could ascend the Iron Throne would send every house into utter chaos. So, for the sake of a long-lasting peace throughout Westeros, mouths were kept quiet, a promise made, a seemingly simple lie easily was spun, and believed with the proof ironically being the very child that could bring the Seven Kingdoms to its knees. Well, shit, said Naruto while rubbing his forehead. But with Jon taking the black, wouldn't revealing the truth now be a good thing, asked Edmure while Blackfish grumbled idiot behind the man's back. No. If anything, it will just make things worse. For all of us. John is in many ways the legal heir to the Iron Throne. Many will see what Ned Stark did as honorable, but others might see it as a means to control the future king, or given how John is now at the wall, prevent House Targaryen from retaking the Iron Throne. Many within House Lannister will want John dead simply out of fear due to how Tywin betrayed the Mad King, Jaime killed the Mad King, and Cersei marrying the man who killed the prince at the Trident. The Tyrells and Dorne were always loyal to House Targaryen so they might raise their banners for Jon in order to get him on the Iron Throne. This whole situation could very well escalate this war even further if this news came to light beyond this room, said Naruto with many frowning at this since he was right. Will Jon still be legitimized given what you know now of his parentage, asked Rob with Naruto surprising him slight by nodding. Yes. He will be legitimized as a Stark. Jon was raised as a Stark. Not a Targaryen. John deserves that much despite taking his vows and joining the Night's Watch. Besides, no one knows the truth about John's lineage outside of all of us here in this room. When the time is right, you can tell your mother the truth about John and get her to think things through clearly. House Stark deserves that much after all the crap it's been through, said Naruto with Rob nodding, since House Stark had been through a lot since Ned Stark first became Hand of the King. So much to do and so little time. Chapter 8 Coming Together Part 1 Kevin Lannister was not a religious man. Not entirely. He was religious at one point in his youth. All children were at one point before they grew up. He believed in the seven. He believed if you did something good or bad, the seven would reward or punish you for it in life, if not the afterlife. It all depended on whether what you did was good or bad depending on the life you lived in the now. If you were good, rewards would be plentiful. If you were bad well, pain and suffering would be your new best friends forever. But as with some adults, when you grow up and you see bad people doing bad things without consequence, your faith in the seven delivering judgment upon such people was shaken. So, when his own older brother destroyed two rival houses, had betrayed the Mad King, and ordered the mountain to violate utterly destroy Elia Martell along with her children as proof to Robert of his loyalty without consequences, while well, your faith in the Seven would waver too. In fact, Kevin had never truly believed in them ever since time when Lannister had crushed all his enemies in the days of his prime leading up to King Robert taking the throne from the Targaryens. But now? Now Kevin wondered once more if the Seven did really exist in the fact they were punishing House Lannister, and himself specifically, for Tywin Lannister's past deeds. Why? Because Kevin Lannister honestly felt he was in hell right now. 
Ever since he had been recalled back to Lannisport per his brother's orders, the younger of the two Lannister siblings felt every day was a struggle to not personally strangle his clearly mad grandnephew Joffrey with his bare hands. The boy was a whiny spoiled pest. And that was being very generous in terms of how to describe him. Every day, Joffrey would cause more and more problems for Kevin, and it was becoming increasingly difficult in fixing the problems the boy created. This usually resulted in the old Lannister having to bribe or threaten the various and many unhappy people within the city of Lannisport who were upset with the boy when he first tried to rule here, and failing at it in the most horrible of ways. If it wasn't for the army Kevin brought with him, Lannisport would be an open rebellion against Joffrey and a major transport hub for supplies to the Lannister troops to fight against the northern forces. Things had hectic for House Lannister since the start of the war itself. The northern army winning one engagement after the next, the people within the western lands finding their lives going from good to bad to downright horrible thanks to the rule of Joffrey Lannister. It was only due to the ceasefire that there was a chance to give Tywin Lannister and his forces a necessary reprieve. Adding in holster Tully dying and the northern army paying its respects to the late liege lord of the Riverlands helped too. We should have our armies march on the northern forces and strike, exclaimed Joffrey angrily during a meeting with the other lords at a council meeting currently being held by the boy. His mother was also present. Another piece of horrible work, in Kevin's opinion. Further proof that the seven were cruel to those who unleashed cruelty on others. Or perhaps she was the proof of the seven being cruel by having someone as heartless as her being alive. It was hard to say. We cannot. The ceasefire is in effect. To violate it now would make our house look like dishonorable fiends your grace, said one of the high lords with a fat nose, a scar on his right cheek, and a decreasing yet greasy hairline. I don't care what other people think. I am the king. I don't care what my so-called older brother says or does while sitting on the Iron Throne. I was king of the Seven Kingdoms first before he came home so his authority doesn't count. Mine does and I say we march our armies toward the northern forces. They won't suspect anything and be wiped out, countered Joffrey in his usual whiny tone. And have all of the Seven Kingdoms allied against us? House Tyrell? Dorn? House Baratheon led by your brother? House Lannister does not have the means, money, or the men to fight them all. Your grandfather may be the most feared Lannister our house has ever had in a long time, but even my brother has his limits, said Kevin firmly while he saw Joffrey was not happy. Grandfather is getting old. He should have crushed the North by now. He is clearly unfit to rule over the Western lands as the Warden of the West, said Joffrey while Kevin took offense to that and narrowed his eyes at the boy. Your grandfather is fighting to keep you safe from harm at the hands of the North. Or have you forgotten what you did to Ned Stark and the abuse his daughter suffered during your short time as king, questioned Kevin while Joffrey glared at him. I am the king. Not my brother. Once the North is crushed, I will have all the armies of House Lannister march on King's Landing. I will take the Iron Throne from my brother and put his head on a pike, exclaimed Joffrey while Kevin scoffed. And be labeled a kinslayer for your efforts? No one will follow you. King or not, said Kevin while Joffrey kept getting angrier. Calm yourself, my son. The Iron Throne will be yours soon enough. There are things currently set in motion that will show our might is not one to be challenged and soon what is yours by right will be restored to you. Be patient, remarked Cersei calmly while smiling at her son. I have been patient long enough in taking back what is mine, remarked Joffrey with his anger calming, but his skull still remained. What did you mean there are things currently set in motion? I am unaware of such plans by my brother to plot against the North during the ceasefire, commented Kevin since he knew his brother well enough to coordinate with him on such plans to help with supplies or additional troops. Father isn't plotting anything right now. He doesn't know his victory is assured, but it has been. Once this war is over, Joffrey will get the credit, and we can move forward to removing the false king from the Iron Throne, said Cersei firmly with a cruel smile on her face. King Naruto is Robert's son. Your son, said Kevin while mentally filing away a side note in his head to send a raven to his brother about what Cersei did behind his back. He is not my son. He is a monster. Robert saw it. I saw it. The only reason we didn't kill the creature was because we would have been labeled kinslayers. I will never acknowledge that thing I brought screaming into the world as my son. He stole from my true son. He stole from the rightful king. 
I will have Joffrey back on the Iron Throne or I will see all of King's Landing burn as a result of denying him what is his to claim, said Cersei angrily while Kevin frowned at the woman. She's clearly gone mad, fought Kevin and the other High Lords in this room. The conversation would have continued further if not for the fact the doors were almost smashed open and Tywin Lannister in his armor came marching through with his men. The look on his face was one of fury, rage, and anger that was directed toward one person in the room with a strong desire to run said person through with his sword. Leave us. All of you, commanded Tywin to the other high lords, who quickly got up, bowed, and left the room in a somewhat dignified fashion befitting their station. Brother, asked Kevin while seeing Tywin walk into the room and walk toward the table where the wine was located. Relax Kevin. It is not you among my own blood that has angered me so much prior to today, said Tywin before he drank some wine in motion for Kevin to move from the headchair that would signify him as head of the house. What happened brother? I thought you and the army were encamped near the fortress of House Knox, asked Kevin with Tywin nodding. We were encamped there. Until a raven reached me not that long ago. From the spider himself, said Tywin before he sat down and handed a rolled up piece of paper to Kevin to read. The Wolf King and the Blackfish have outmaneuvered the flayed men and the twins. No wolf pelts or fish bones for the lioness. Tell the mother of the royal stag he sends his regards. Best regards. The Spider. What is this? Some form of bad poetry by the spider, asked Kevin in confusion while Tywin looked at him for a second before he focused on Cersei. It is quite simple really to those who understand what has been happening in the last few weeks. I understand why Kevin doesn't understand the meaning since he has been busy not only keeping Lannisport, but the Western lands itself from turning against us thanks to my daughter and my grandson, said Tywin while he glanced at the boy in the room. What are you talking about father, asked Cersei calmly, but inside, she was nervous since even the daughter of Tywin Lannister knew things were not what she was expecting from her father's sudden return. Your scheme to have House Bolton and House Fry betray the Northern Lords loyal to House Stark has backfired Cersei. House Bolton and House Fry is no more. They were crushed at the twins themselves during what is being called the Red Wedding that was hosted there. Apparently, Walder Fry along with Roose Bolton planned to betray House Stark during the wedding between Edmir Tully and Roslyn Fry. Killing all those loyal to House Stark from the wolf pup himself to his northern lords and their bannermen, said Tywin Lannister while he glared at Cersei. And violate the guest rights? Surely not even Walder Fry would stoop that low, asked Kevin with Tywin glancing over at him. He did. Apparently, the elderly man was offered a good deal for his cooperation by my daughter in the plan to murder them all. Walder Fry was promised the Riverlands and a great deal of gold from our house if he destroyed the Northern Army along with getting Jaime back to us alive. A similar deal was offered to Roose Bolton, said Tywin while glaring at Cersei with even greater anger. And what does Roose Bolton get outside of the gold we apparently would pay him for his service to us in committing such a foul act, asked Kevin curiously since gold was not enough for a man like Roose Bolton. Our backing him in being the new warden of the north once he marched his army back to Winterfell, killed the remaining Starks, and brought the rest of the north to heel, said Tywin while Kevin shook his head. As if the north would allow someone like Roose Bolton to be their new warden. They would never accept it. They would violently oppose him and his bannermen, said Kevin knowing well enough the North did not take kindly to betrayals of any kind. Which was why the plan was a foolish one to consider since the moment of its creation by those involved in the plot. The vast majority of the North loved the Starks. All of them. From the youngest child to the late Ned Stark himself. Even their bastard Jon Snow is treated with some measure of respect there despite how people in the Seven Kingdoms view bastards in general. The same with House Tully and the Blackfish. If House Fry and House Bolton had succeeded in their plot, they would have to deal with an even more infuriated North and the Riverlands. The number of men who would rally to fight would have no doubt doubled, if not tripled, and calls for blood against such betrayers would be answered from all corners of the Seven Kingdoms, said Tywin knowing his own house would also be targeted since he would have benefited from this betrayal and everyone in the Seven Kingdoms knew it. Guilty by association. Even if Tywin himself had no hand in it. And where does the king stand on this? asked Kevin while Tywin glared once more at Cersei. The king was the one who helped House Stark and House Tully from being annihilated at the Red Wedding. He marched with an army of Baratheon bannermen and Kingsguard to the twins. He turned the plot against the conspirators and crushed them without mercy in his soul, said Tywin while he saw Cersei scowl at the mention of her estranged son and king of the Seven Kingdoms. Damn that boy! 
I should have just killed him myself, thought Cersei angrily. He is a traitor to our house, exclaimed Joffrey with a hint of excitement since he felt this could be used to make him king again. Be silent. I have tolerated your presence here long enough, bellowed Tywin now with his eyes focused on Joffrey. Father, asked Cersei while Tywin's hands were clenched fists on the table. How could you do this to this me Cersei? How could you shame me in this way? Shame my house? Shame my legacy, demanded Tywin in anger. I have done no such thing protested Cersei, but the glare he shot her made the woman look away. Do. Not. Lie. To me Cersei. I received messages from your son on the Iron Throne. From the spider. Both of them encouraging me to do my own investigation into the accusations made against you. Against the parentage of Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen. So, I did. I did it during the start of the ceasefire and I prayed to the gods, both the old and the new that the accusations were wrong. I prayed for the first time in many years since the days when my wife was struggling to give birth to Tyrion. I prayed they were wrong. Do you know what my prayers have given me, Cersei, replied Tywin in a cold dangerous tone? Brother, you don't mean to say, the rumors? What Stannis sent out to every corner of the Seven Kingdoms about Cersei are, are true asked Kevin since he pieced things together from his brother's words. Every word of it, answered Tywin while Cersei looked away with fear on her face. Do you know what you have done? The lives lost? The people dead from this war you helped cause to ensure the secret never saw the light of day, demanded Kevin angrily now since he now feared for his son Lancel due to the boy being around her so much. If Cersei would do that with her own brother, then Lancel might have been, by the gods no. It was for the benefit of House Lannister and myself, replied Cersei while Kevin glared at her. Your actions shame us all Cersei. Shame our house. Shame me, your father, and your brother, said Kevin while glaring fully at Cersei for her actions. How is it a shaming of our house? I love Jamie. He loves me. We were born together in the womb. It is only right we would have such a close bond. Siblings of House Targaryen were together in such a way for nearly a thousand years, countered Cersei while Kevin narrowing his eyes. And as a result, half of them succumbed to madness. The Mad King being one of them, said Tywin in a deep angry guttural tone of voice. I will only ask you this once Cersei. If you lie, I do not care if you are my brother's only daughter. I do not care if I am labeled a kinslayer and be forced to take the black. Have you been engaging in sexual relations with my son? asked Kevin while he glared at his niece with an intensity worthy of a Lannister. But Cersei refused to answer. Why should she answer? She was the daughter of Tymon Lannister, the Queen Regent, and one of the wealthiest women in the Seven Kingdoms as a result. In her mind, Cersei Lannister answered to no one. I see. Your silence says enough on the issue, remarked Tywin before he glanced at his brother and motioned him to leave and to confront his son about it. I will not apologize for loving my brother the way I do. Not even you can make me feel such a thing, said Cersei while Tywin glared at her for a moment. I have decided the best course of action regarding this war is to make peace with the North and House Stark. We will leave for King's Landing within the week and all who are responsible for this mess will face justice. We will head there with a small, yet still formidable escort to prevent anyone from trying anything. Guards. Get them out of my sight, commanded Tywin with the shocked look on Cersei's and Joffrey's face showing they did not expect him to do this. Tywin Lannister? Yielding to the current king of the Seven Kingdoms? Without even a protest? Without a fight? Without an army to intimidate the opposition? Impossible. How can you do this? We are Lannisters. We are lions. Everyone must bow to us. I am your daughter. Joffrey is your grandson. We are your blood. You should be out there with the army fighting everyone and anyone for us like a Lannister should, protested a very angry Cersei at her father's decision while being dragged away by Lannister guards. Foolish girl. I do this for the greater good of House Lannister. I must save what is left of my house and my legacy before you along with your brother destroy it, thought Tywin while sighing at how things had come to this. He had indeed investigated King Naruto's claims, first declared by Stannis, about the ever-questionable relationship between Cersei, Jaime, and the three blonde-haired children his daughter had brought screaming into the world. At first, 
Taiwan didn't believe it, as was the natural reaction to this sort of accusation. You don't want to believe that two of your own children, who you raised to be better than everyone else, would do such a thing and in the process stain the honor of the house they were born into, especially when they were born into such a prestigious house as House Lannister. But alas, Tywin's investigations had proven to him that not only did Cersei and Jaime have an incestuous affair, but the proof of it was the three living breathing children they had together. Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen were all proof of his daughter and son having said affair while Cersei was married to Robert. It had infuriated Tywin to no end at this information, as he had seen what the Targaryens had done with their legacy when practicing such things, and had brought them to ruin. To think his own children would do such acts that were not only considered sinful by the gods above, but any children they had from such union, which they did, could inherit nothing as a result unless they were legalized by the ruling member of the house. There was a greater chance of the White Walkers coming over the wall to make peace with men instead of trying to wipe them out. Not only that, but the stain from this action was on House Lannister to such a degree, it wouldn't, or possibly couldn't be removed for at least five to six generations of men in the years to come. Maybe more. Which was why Tywin knew when to throw down his sword or turn his cloak. A man of his position always saw where the winds of victory or defeat were blowing. In any given situation, a man in his position would need a way out to keep his head, but also his house intact. The North had been winning battle after the battle, their cause, their reason behind this war had reached all parts of the Seven Kingdoms, and given how most if not all of it was true, Lannister men were dropping like flies. This ceasefire had been a blessing in disguise for him. It gave Tywin a chance to recoup some of his losses and think up strategies to counter the North on his terms. But as time went by, he learned of his twin children and their actions which resulted in this war, if not this sinful existence that was Joffrey to be born into this world. Marcella could be seen as her mother's daughter in terms of looks so anyone being told how she was born would not believe it. Tommen would sadly be been seen like Joffrey, which was a bastard born of incest, and thus was unable to inherit anything Lannister. Regardless, Tywin knew this war was now pointless. The fight for the sake of fighting was something only the Mad King would do. He was not the Mad King. He was and always would be a Lannister. And a Lannister did not fight a war for the sake of pointless fighting. No. Lannister fight their enemies because they are in the right. When they fight, it is because the fight has purpose, and the outcome determines if the overall war itself was worth it. This was not one of those wars, fights, or times to do such things. Peace would be made. Tywin knew one way or another, it would happen. Whether he or his house lived to see it was another matter. King's Landing sometime later. Naruto rode into the city with a sense of accomplishment filling him. Men from House Baratheon returned home with a sense of dignity and honor once more after fighting for their king and lord they should have fought for in the first place. He had saved the North from being torn apart and destroyed. Saved House Tully from losing everything to House Fry. And word had reached him from Tyrion via a raven on the way back that he had a surprise for him of unexpected proportions. While finding that hard to believe, the King of the Seven Kingdoms wasn't about to call his hand a liar since that didn't really fit into Tyrion's persona. Drinking, gambling, and the occasional sexual relations with a woman, yes. But a liar? No. At least not when it came to all things kingly and running the Seven Kingdoms in a professional manner. Making his way to the Red Keep, Naruto entered the small council chambers to see his small council waiting for him. Among them however, standing with members of the city watch in the room, was one Ser Davos Seaworth, Shireen Baratheon, and Gendry Waters. Well, this is quite the unexpected surprise. And here I thought you were pulling my leg when I got your message Tyrion, remarked Naruto with a smirk and saw his uncle was returning it. Tempting, but no. Varys assured me that teasing the king is almost tantamount to that of treason. I don't think you need another Lannister added to that category and I do not want to be in it, remarked Tyrion with Naruto laughing and turning to face Ser Davos. You are Ser Davos Seaworth. The infamous Onion Knight. It's because of you that my uncle and his men were able to survive dying by starvation, said Naruto with a genuine smile on his face. I. Dying of hunger is no way to go. For any man, said Ser Davos knowing many had gone mad from the need to eat when there was little to no food to eat at all. Agreed. You did right by my uncle. Even if he did rise against me thanks to that damn red woman now occupying Dragonstone. 
Which brings me to the lovely lady in front of me, said Naruto while seeing his cousin curtsying slightly in his presence. Your grace, said Shireen while she saw Naruto's smile increase. Cousin. We are family. Call me Naruto. Please. Calling me king or your grace is for those incredibly boring parties we must occasionally attend, said Naruto with Shireen smiling and gave the old Baratheon a hug. Brother, asked Gendry with a hint of uncertainty. Gendry. You look so much like my father did in his prime. It is almost scary. You just need a beard and his armor, said Naruto since he had seen pictures and paintings of his father that were drawn during the rebellion. Thank you. I'll admit, I never expected to be in King's Landing again. Much less in the Red Keep where the king rules from, said Gendry while Naruto nodded and embraced the man in a hug. Neither did I. But look at us. We are now a family. Each of us uniting after being kept away from each other for long by outside forces. No longer. Starting tomorrow, you my dear brother are getting the necessary education needed to be a Baratheon and run things in the Stormlands, said Naruto while Gendry was surprised by this. But I am a bastard. I have no claim to any titles or lands, said Gendry while Naruto just smirked at him. For the moment. Once you get a much-needed education by some of the best teachers the Seven Kingdoms has to offer, you'll be ready to rule over the Stormlands as my very own legitimatized brother, said Naruto with Gendry looking completely stunned. You would do that? Even though we just met for the first time, asked Gendry while he was unsure how to treat this. Of course. We are family. Regardless of who our different mothers were, we are still bound in blood. We have only each other and Shireen now as part of our house. After my moron for a half-brother Joffrey killed all of our half-siblings in an act of fear of being usurped, I realized if I did nothing, the entirety of House Baratheon risked being totally destroyed or reduced to a small trickle. You have been put down all your life. Treated like a plague or something unwanted. Well, I don't see you that way. You are my brother. My family. If I abandoned you now, I would be lower than worms in the ground. I would be lower than the shit that comes out of an animal's ass, said Naruto while whispering the last part so Shireen wouldn't hear it. What will happen to our cousin, asked Gendry while unsure what to call the girl in front of them. Simple. She is staying here. Under my royal protection. Anyone who lays harm upon you or her will be considered treason and they will label enemies of the crown for all time, said Naruto while Gendry and Shireen smiled at that. Not to interrupt this moment your grace, but there is some matters I feel need to be addressed that can't wait, said Ser Davos while he moved slightly from side to side on his feet. Yes, there is. First, as a reward for your loyal service to my house in getting these two Baratheons, and your knowledge of the sea, I name you master of ships. To sit on the small council and serve me loyally as you once did my uncle, said Naruto with Ser Davos looking shocked by this. I am honored your grace. I came from nothing. Many of the high lords frowned upon my rise to knighthood and my favor with Stannis, even before the red woman got her influence wrapped around his mind. But I never forgot where I came from and reminded myself daily of it so I wouldn't become one of those arrogant enough to believe they were above everyone else, said Ser Davos with Naruto smiling and patting the man's shoulder. Good. Humble men on the small council keep the rest of us, namely me, from making stupid mistakes. Sit down my new master of ships. You look just about ready to collapse. The same with you too, said Naruto with Ser Davos sitting down in his assigned chair and two more chairs were being brought in. Not to question this, but should your half-brother and cousin be sitting in on this small council meeting, asked Tyrion curiously. They are family Tyrion. I wish it. I command it. Besides, if these two are learn the ways of ruling the respective sections of House Baratheon when the time comes, what a better way to learn than now in this room. They will listen to what goes on here, but only speak when spoken to given their current stations in life. No disrespect to my family here, but some traditions must be upheld, said Naruto while knowing Shireen was too young to consider herself a vocal member here and Gendry was still a bastard so his presence was only allowed through that of royal command. News from the North Your Grace The Northern Army has made its return to Winterfell and I am pleased to announce Lady Arya Stark is also there to greet them. She arrived sometime before Rob Stark and his family did back to Winterfell. But there is more in regards to what is left of House Bolton, said Varys while Naruto narrowed his eyes. What news? House Bolton is no more, correct? asked Naruto. 
for the most part your grace. As you may or may not know, Roose Bolton has a son, or rather a bastard for a son. A Snow. Named Ramsay. Like John Snow, who was raised in Winterfell, Ramsay Snow was raised by his father in the Dreadfort, and like his father, the boy has many, cruel habits, said Varys while not wishing to speak them in front of the young girl in the room, meaning Ramsay did things he wasn't supposed to do under the laws set by the Warden of the North. Whether it was Ned Stark or one of his sons, surmised Naruto with Varys nodding, yes, your grace. It would seem that Ramsay took his father's teachings on how to hurt people and was not only good at it, but made improvements regarding the end results. In short, he broke the minds of those hurt by his hands, and turned them into obedient and submissive slaves to use for his enjoyment. After the Northern Army and the House Lords returned to the North, Rob Stark took his bannermen to the Dreadfort to take control of it, and anyone loyal to House Bolton. What they found when taking control of the castle was very disturbing, replied Varys while he glanced over at Shireen knowing the girl was still innocent to most things in the way people acted. How bad? asked Naruto while he also glanced over at his now nervous and innocent cousin. Bad to the point where all the men at the Dreadfort were put to the sword soon after the discovery of Ramsay's activities in the north. He would have done worse if not for the fact you sent an army to repel the Ironborn invasion, said Varys while Naruto nodded. Ramsay is one of those now among the dead I take it, asked Naruto just to clarify the bastard of the Dreadfort was dead. Yes, your grace. He went down fighting. Laughing at the idea of killing and torturing so many people in the belief his side would win. Ironically, one of his own slaves turned on him in a fit of panic-induced rage from the fighting itself, and was stabbed multiple times before Rob Stark took his head off. The North will need time to recover and heal from such an act, said Varys while Naruto let out noise. What is going on with the Ironborn and House Greyjoy, asked Naruto while Varys took a moment to collect his thoughts on the that one. House Greyjoy has lost much of its standing with the other Ironborn houses. From what my little birds have learned, many of them are considering the idea removing Balon from his seat for a more suitable candidate to rule. Not surprising given how his plan to attack the North failed, his daughter badly injured, yet alive, and his only remaining son Theon is now a prisoner in the North, said Varys with Naruto scowling at the mention of Theon and how the fool betrayed the Starks for a father that didn't even want him. But Theon would learn soon enough that treachery, whether in North or right here within the city of King's Landing, was not tolerated. Winter fell the dungeons at the moment. Rob Stark looked at his once sworn brother with fury and rage in his eyes. Theon had been captured during the attack on the north by the Greyjoy fleet. Word had been sent by Rob to not treat Theon as an ally and to detain him, if possible, when spotted among the enemy. While they had orders to not kill the last of Balon Greyjoy's sons, they did not have to be afraid of killing the man should it come down to it. In the end, nearly all of the Ironborn with Theon were killed, and the man himself was captured before being thrown into the dungeon at Winterfell. And now here the Greyjoy sat. In chains, skinny from the lack of food or water given to him, which was very little during his time here as a prisoner. Part of Rob Stark wanted his mother here for this too. He wanted her here to deliver a mother's wrath upon Theon. It was learned from one of the surviving Ironborn with Theon that they planned to sack Winterfell and make House Stark lose its remaining sons by the way of the Iron Price. Theon knew his mother was a fearsome woman, the temper of a Tully was strong in her, and she was not afraid to take a weapon into those usually gentle hands to destroy anyone wishing to hurt the family she loved. But for the moment, the woman was not here yet, as he wanted to secure the North entirely after the issue with Roose Bolton at the Twins. At the time, he needed to round up all of the bannermen loyal to House Bolton still roaming the North and couldn't risk his mother's safety. She would be here soon enough, but with a proper escort, and one that knew the North like the back of their hands so they would know if something was amiss in their travels. But that was elsewhere. This was the now. I trusted you Theon. You were my sworn brother. You kneeled before me in front of all the lords of the North and pledged your sword to my cause. To House Stark, whispered Rob with anger in his voice. I know. I'm sorry Rob, but I, said Theon, but was silenced by a punch to the face. Don't speak Greyjoy. You lost the right to make excuses when you sided with your father over my house. My house that took you in after the failed Greyjoy rebellion. My house that raised you. Taught you. My house, under my father, actually treated you with some measure of respect. If it weren't for my father, you wouldn't even know how to wield a sword in your hands properly, or spell our own name. 
When you were brought here, everyone said you should have been sent to House Bolton, or possibly one of the stricter houses here in the north. But my father showed you kindness. Mercy. And how did you repay him? Repay me? By siding with the Ironborn in trying to attack the North, exclaimed Rob with his voice nearly to the point of shouting. I tried to convince my father to join you. I really did. But he wouldn't listen to me. I told him, the Western Lands were a far richer prize. The Western Lands and House Lannister has some of the wealthiest people in all of Westeros located there. I told him, if the Ironborn were going to truly return to the old ways, and make a name for themselves they should attack House Lannister. But my father wouldn't listen. He looked at me and saw nothing but weakness. I was a dog he had willingly cast away, but now when I had returned to my family home a man, instead of embracing his last remaining son and heir, he had chosen to listen to my sister for advice on what to do, said Theon with Rob scoffing. And you went right along with them. Just to prove yourself to the father that threw you away, like a diseased dog, said Rob while Theon shook his head. I wanted to warn you Rob. I thought about it. I even wrote a message to warn you of the impending attack by my father and my sister's fleet. But I destroyed it. I just wanted my father's approval and love so much. I thought, I thought if I showed my father that I could act like the Ironborn, he would accept me as his son and as his heir. Don't you see? I wanted what you had Rob. I wanted a father's love for his son. Siding with him was the only way I could have achieved it, exclaimed Theon while Rob felt a small sliver of pity for the man given what was just said. But it died when Rob recalled how his own father had raised the Greyjoy like a son and had given Theon plenty of room to be his own man while staying at Winterfell. Ned Stark had tolerated Theon's love for the whores at the brothels despite his wife frowning at the idea of Theon not only being at Winterfell with such freedom, but going to the brothels and risked siring bastards of ironborn blood. Rob had been the same way. Let the man indulge himself. Love the North too much to betray it. That had been Ned's reasoning and it had worked, until the temptation of acquiring a father's love had overpowered the love of living in the North. Theon had everything in the North he would never get from the Iron Islands and chose the latter over the former for something that would never happen, and there was a price to be paid for such betrayal. You swore your sword to me, Theon. Before the old gods and the new. You swore to fight for me as a brother of the North. Yet you broke your oath when you sided with your father's house for something that would never happen. The gods do not tolerate those who break their oaths, Theon. Nor do I for that matter. I am taking you with me to King's Landing. Someone like you has no place here in the North, whether they are its ward, its prisoner, or even a corpse if I were to kill you now. When you die, it will not be here in the north. The men who died defending the north from your house get buried here. Not those who fight it. Your invasion force has been repelled and most of the men sent here by your father were killed. Their bodies were thrown into the water to meet the drowned god and to rot at the bottom of the sea they loved so much. You considered yourself an ironborn over being one of the north. For your treachery, I will deny you the honor of being buried here when you die. Whether the king in King's Landing throws your corpse into the sea after you die will be up to him. I wash my hands of you, Theon. Now and for all time, said Rob before leaving the room. Rob, come back. Please. I'm sorry. Please, Rob. Please, pleaded Theon while his words went unanswered to the Lord of House Stark and everyone else who heard him. King's Landing. Lady Elena was, for the most part, impressed by the sight of Naruto Baratheon and the way the man treated her granddaughter Marjorie. The Queen of Thorns had arrived in King's Landing just a few days ago, expecting the foul stench of the city to nearly knock her back several feet and wish she had never left the reach at all. But, to her immense relief, and surprise the city didn't smell so bad. In fact, it was as if someone had managed to air out the majority of the stench from the city and made the air breathable again, which was good because Elena didn't know how long her nose could handle such a thing while here had it been bad as she remembered. When Elena was first introduced to the new king, it was clear Naruto was a mixture of Baratheon and Lannister blood. Though the Baratheon blood held more sway over the Lannister side given the blonde hair was noticeably a darker shade. The mismatched eyes had caught the old woman off her guard since such eyes were a rare sight and it was clear from those eyes that some of the Targaryen blood from Robert's side of his house had in fact tried to make itself known. 
One eye had been a success, but the other was a mixture of purple Targaryen and Baratheon blue to make the red, which was fine with Olena. At least this one wasn't a product born of incest between siblings like the Targaryens or Tywin Lannister's twin children. Olena felt there was nothing wrong with a little diversity in the gene pool. She had seen enough of the exact opposite with the Targaryens to know that much to be true. Your grace, is it possible I could spend some time alone with my grandmother? It has been a while since we spoke and I have much to discuss with her, said Marjorie with Naruto nodding. Of course. I have some matters to attend to regarding the peace talks between House Stark and House Lannister. My ladies, said Naruto before he left the two women to talk about things, namely himself. Honestly child, you need to try harder to catch the king's interest in you, remarked Elena once Naruto was out of hearing range. Grandmother. I am trying. It has not been easy. The man is very active in regards to his duties as king and in keeping himself physically fit. He spends what time there is during the day with me when not being a king. The upcoming peace talks between House Stark and House Lannister is fast approaching grandmother. Would you expect the King of the Seven Kingdoms to ignore such an important, countered Marjorie with Elena shaking her head no. Of course not. At least the king takes his duties seriously. Not like his father. The man spent all his days drinking, hunting, whoring, and siring bastards. One of which I am told the king plans to legitimize soon, replied Elena with Marjorie nodding. Yes. Gendry Waters. He is the only bastard left after Prince Joffrey had the others killed when still king, said Marjorie while Olena scoffed. Prince Joffrey. Please. Robert's bastards are more worthy of being called a prince or a lord over that boy any day. The child can't even run the city of Lannisport properly from what I have heard. His great uncle Kevin Lannister had to come with an army to keep the boy in line in the city from rebelling said Elena while she thought about how her house had almost considered the idea of marrying Marjorie off to Joffrey after Renly died. They only stayed their hand because they had learned the current king sitting on the Iron Throne was not some usurper or pretender to be of Baratheon blood. All the same mother, I am trying my best. From what I have seen of Naruto, any attempt to be more ambitious in enticing him will only cause problems. He wants to know me as a person before committing to that kind of thing, replied Marjorie while Elena made a noise at that. Well, at least he has some measure of restraint. Not like his father. If Robert were here, he would try to get between your legs faster than you can shot Targaryen, remarked Elena with Marjorie nodding since she had heard of King Robert's exploits with the women who caught his fancy. Naruto is setting the pace mother. If I try to rush things, I will only push him away. To be honest, I prefer it this way, said Marjorie with Elena looking a tad surprised. Oh? You prefer to have the man set the pace? I thought I taught you better, questioned Elena while Marjorie shook her head. It's not that. When I am with the king, we talk about ourselves, our interests, our likes, our dislikes, stories of our childhood, and other events of our lives. We are forming a connection grandmother. Something beyond arranged marriages, unions, or alliances between houses. No backstabbing. No manipulations. The king and I are trying to form an honest relationship. Isn't that worth something? asked Marjorie while Elena just smiled fondly at her. I suppose it is, for the most part. These days, a woman can't get what she wants unless it results with sleeping with the man who has what she wants. And even after the woman fucks the man, the man just denies her and would throw the woman into the street like she was common whore. At the very least, you won't have that issue here. The king is not the monster I had originally envisioned after his actions against his uncle were being portrayed, said Elena with Marjorie smiling. He's not a monster grandmother. At least not to his friends and allies. In many ways, Naruto is a lot like the Stark with their honor, yet is vicious in battle like his father was from the stories you told about the rebellions, and even cunning like the Lannisters. He cares about the people. The city is thriving because of him and his actions grandmother. The people love this king and don't see him as the son of the usurper. They see him as the king they have needed since when the mad king came to sit on the iron throne. If I am to one day be the queen sitting beside the king, I must play the part set for me in this grandmother, and my part is to be the woman who doesn't marry for titles or power. But for actual love. 
Would it really be so bad if I married the king not for his position, but because he is a good man worthy of my love? Questioned Marjorie with Olena's smile increasing. Of course, not dear. Many women in our position would try to marry simply for the title of being queen. To be wrapped in the trappings of power and believe their word when the king is not around is law. That their position is absolute. At least until they give birth and the child they bring screaming into the world comes of age to knock them into the shadows to retire somewhere with a handful of servants to some remote castle. Bah! As if I would let that happen to you. If this king can make you happy and the price to pay is to follow his pace, I won't intervene. Besides, the actual opposition here while impressive for the most part, still can't compare to you, said Olena while Marjorie frowned. What competition? asked Marjorie while Olena raised an eyebrow at her. The Stark girl my dear. Don't think I didn't see her in passing when you were with the king. Or how she glances at the king himself and no doubt wishes to be in your place. Sansa Stark is a flower unto herself child. One who is starting to show off her beauty and it won't be long before the men around us start to turn their heads in the direction of this woman. Lyanna Stark and Caitlin Tully were and still are beautiful women in their own right. One caused a war and the other is still nothing to scoff at when you compare her to the other women of the time. Caitlin Tully's beauty rivaled and still does rival Cersei Lannister, who was considered the most beautiful woman in all of Westeros when she was about to marry Robert. Cersei herself is still beautiful in her own way, but Caitlin Tully Stark has a more refined look to her. In terms of beauty, she has what makes the people bow in respect over wanting to fuck her like they do with Cersei. That is the kind of beauty Sansa Stark possesses or will possess soon enough. You might have the king's interest now, but that could change should Sansa make an attempt with her own charms, said Olena, knowing there was some competition for the king's attention and while the Stark girl wasn't a true threat, she could be one. I highly doubt it grandmother. Sansa will probably return to the north at the assistance of her brother once the peace treaty is official between the Starks and Lannisters, said Marjorie while Olena scoffed. You assume too much my dear. The Stark girl prefers warmer climates to the cold ones of the north. Short of Highgarden and Dorne, you can't get much further south, and with an actual king who is yet to marry. The temptation of staying here is too much for any woman in her position to resist, said Olena with Marjorie's smile fading a bit. She seems like an honest girl mother, remarked Marjorie since she had met and talked with Sansa on multiple occasions. Honest means naive and naive means dead. The only reason she wasn't killed sooner after the bloody mess with when Joffrey was king was due to her previously arranged marriage setup by Robert and Ned Stark. Killing your future wife is frowned upon by all and not even a king can get away with it. Even if it was a false king like Joffrey. But mark my words child, if the girl allows to gather her wits and sharpen her mind, you will be tested. It has already started after what happened in front of the Stark girl with the death of her father and the torture that brat for a bastard of a Lannister did when on the Iron Throne, warned Elena since she knew so long as the Stark girl was in King's Landing and the king is unmarried, the chance for a woman of House Tyrell being queen was still at risk. Will you stick around for the peace talks grandmother? I know you came to see if the king was worthy of courting me in the future, but this will become a monumental event, said Marjorie with Elena scoffing. Monumental event. Bah! Wars were fought throughout the Seven Kingdoms when I was still a young woman. Rebellions too. Don't let this peace talks and potential peace treaty between these two houses fool you, my child. The war may be over now, but another one, and one after that one will pop out somewhere. Maybe not during your time, but certainly in future generations beyond your own. The Seven Kingdoms have always had wars and rebellions. Houses crush houses. Alliance is made and broken all the time. I will stay for this monumental event, but unless you are getting married soon after, I am returning home to High Garden, replied Elena while Marjorie was saddened to hear that. Grandmother, what do you see when you look at me? asked Marjorie suddenly out of the blue. I see my granddaughter. I see a beautiful woman with a sharp mind to match her body. One I used to have back in my younger years. Back when marrying into House Targaryen was all the rage and everyone who was everyone wanted to be part of such a grand house that had a king on the Iron Throne. I almost married into their house, but when I saw my husband-to-be, I knew the man just wouldn't do. Targaryen or not. The man I wanted was your grandfather and he was going to propose to your great-aunt to marry him. 
So the day before his intended proposal, I visited him in his chambers after I got lost from my embroidery lessons. The next day, your grandfather could barely get out of bed and out of his room to stumble down the stairs. By the time your grandfather could even stand up straight, the only thing he wanted was what I had given him the previous night, and only wanted it from me. The very thought of some other man receiving what he did had made your grandfather forget all about your great aunt and focused all of his attention solely on me, said Elena while she smiled at the memory of her husband, who after finally finding strength in his legs, used what was left to find her, fall to his knees, and all but begged her to be his wife. Well, I'm not doing that grandmother. I think the king would frown up that in me if I tried. He doesn't mind strong women, but I think the idea of a woman using such methods to get what we want to be beneath us. Demeaning to women in general, said Marjorie with Elena laughing for a second. This king keeps getting more interesting by the second. Perhaps he is worthy of you my dear. If you do marry this man, do what you have to do in order to keep from looking at any other woman. Show him that why there are plenty of women in the world, none of them, can make him feel appreciated like a man should in the bedroom like you can, said Elena while Marjorie blushed at what her grandmother was referring to in terms of what she would need to do in order for Naruto to never look at another woman with lust. Grandmother, exclaimed Marjorie with embarrassment. Elena smirked at her grandchild. Marjorie was a smart woman. Her successor to the title of Queen of Thorns. Hopefully a literal queen. One loved by the people and by a king who would do everything in his power to prove his love. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfiction. Looking forward to having you on board again.